Hi, thank you for joining us for a live conversation about the coronavirus in Idaho. This is our second live conversation about the coronavirus in Idaho. I'm Audrey Dutton, health and investigative reporter for the Idaho Statesman. We're almost eight months into the pandemic in Idaho. New infections are at record highs, just as we are heading into flu season. We're fortunate to have one of the most knowledgeable people in Idaho healthcare here with us today to help make sense of what's happening. Dr. David Pate retired this year from his longtime job as uh, CEO of St. Luke's Health System, the largest health system in Idaho. He now helps advise the governor as a member of the coronavirus working group. Uh, he blogs at drpatesblog.com. And you can find him on Twitter, answering questions there too, at, at Dr. Pate's blog. We've received more than 100 questions for Dr. Pate from statement <laughs> readers, from statement readers. So we are going to dive in soon to start getting those answered. And please, if you have questions, leave them in the comments. We're monitoring them live. Um, first, though, I'd like to take the first question. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Pate, now that we're a few weeks into um, <clears throat> school year, what do you think of how school districts have handled things so far um, with face-to-face -face instruction and even with sports, um, despite our rising number of cases? Um, we got questions about this from a lot of people. What are your thoughts? It's, it's a great question. Uh, I, I will say overall, it has gone far better than I thought it would go. Um, there's been a lot of variability, uh, and that's because different schools are all taking different approaches. Uh, but I would say overall, things have gone better uh, than I had feared. Um, I think the schools that we saw that struggled, that had uh, challenges and some that even had to close, uh, you could tie it back to uh, just not doing the fundamentals. Uh, for example, it, it is not enough to just encourage face masks. You have to wear them and everybody has to wear them if it's going to be effective. And, and so I think we learned that. Unfortunately, we learned it over and over and over again as some of these schools had problems. But on the other hand, if you look at uh, uh, a, a number of the schools that really had good plans and uh, stuck to those, uh, they've really done quite well. Now, I am certainly not at the point of being uh, prepared to declare victory because uh, we've been phasing in the openings. Some schools have not been open that long. Some schools are getting ready to open. Some schools are bringing on more and more students. And I do think uh, that we're going to struggle more in the middle schools and high schools than we are in the elementary schools. And so, um, you know, that worries me and we'll, we'll be watching. Uh, in addition, as you mentioned in the tee up, uh, we're getting ready to start with our cold and flu season. And I think that's going to make matters uh, worse. I think as a general statement, what we've seen is activities in the classroom have generally been good. There's been a few problems, but generally good. It's really been the activities associated with school outside the classroom, sports and those kinds of things that have been far more challenging. <clears throat> well, what do you think of sports then? I mean, we've got schools doing indoor sports right now. Is that something that's safe? Well, uh, you know, I get that question all the time and I have a, a number of follow-up questions. Which sport? Uh, so for example, uh, you know, I've been asked about swimming. Swimming overall is pretty safe. Uh, on the other hand, I'm having a little bit of a panic attack uh, because I heard uh, that Boise uh, School District is planning to start wrestling next week. If you asked me to pick, you said, Dr. Pate, what's the most dangerous sport you could imagine? I'd say wrestling. Uh, so uh, not all sports are created equal. Uh, is one thing. And then the second thing is, it's not just the sport activity. So as I said, for example, let's take swimming as the example. <clears throat> is swimming safe? Pretty safe. Um, you aren't going to be wearing a mask while you swim. You shouldn't. Uh, but you're going to be in a swim lane. You're going to be moving. You're not going to be real close to others. 
that's pretty safe. But now on the other hand, if you tell me when that swimmer is not swimming, that that swimmer is congregated on the side of the pool with four or five other swimmers who are not wearing masks and they're all cheering on their teammate, well, now it's just become dangerous. Um, and uh, other things like, are there going to be team meetings with the coach? Are those going to be in person? Are they going to be distanced? Are they going to be wearing masks? That can change the dynamics of it. Are there going to be away games or away meets? Um, are kids going to be carpooling? That would be dangerous. Are they going to be riding buses? Buses have turned out to be a problem in some parts of Idaho. So um, it, it's really a far more complicated question. Uh, but what I have tended to find is not a whole lot of detail about how they're keeping sports safe in these operational plans. Yeah, and it seems like a lot of sports that happen indoors, you know, basketball, that's yeah. high contact. And, you know, know, what we know about transmission, you've got people sharing air. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's definitely one of the biggest things that our readers are concerned about. Um, yeah. you, you talked about uh, it's not enough to encourage mask wearing. We right. have to wear it. We don't have a statewide mask mandate. Um, I asked earlier, one of earlier today, one of our physician leaders, what, if anything, could the governor do um, to reverse the the worrying trends that we're seeing? Um, and mask mandates came up as um, something that you know, if it's not enforced, what can you do? So I think it's really tricky. But what are your thoughts on how do we get people to wear masks if we're just encouraging them effectively? Yeah. Well, and, and you've got a great point. Uh, it's kind of like if I encouraged my uh, kids to be home by 11 o'clock at night, uh, you can imagine what time they'd be coming in. Uh, so um, on the other hand, uh, you know, let's talk about the practical difficulties. Um, let's let's just take for a moment. Let's because uh, a lot of people say, you know, Dr. Pate, encourage the governor to impose a statewide mandate. And, and he and I have had these conversations. So it's not like this has never occurred to the governor, uh, but it's really not that simple. So if you, if you kind of look at what are the dynamics here? Well, the first thing is uh, to my great disappointment, the governor who took very strong steps at the beginning of this pandemic, the statewide emergency uh, declaration, which was very important, and he did that. The stay in home, a stay at home order that at that time was very important. The legislature is all in an uproar. And, and now, as you heard, uh, you know, when they had their recent uh, convening, they're talking about coming uh, back in January and stripping uh, the, some of the governor's powers. Um, and so they already think that he has overreached. And this is terribly, terribly disappointing and alarming to me. So on, on the one hand, if the governor were to uh, make that order, um, I, I think, it, it, you know, the problem is we could have consequences from the legislature that will impact us for many years uh, to come. A second uh, thing is a mandate um, is uh, not as helpful if people aren't willing to follow it. And we have seen some egreg egregious behavior around the state. Uh, I'm thinking of one activity up north uh, where some people got together to kind of provoke uh, the law system uh, in defiance. Uh, and it just created, a, you know, a huge amount of turmoil over something that really shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and then we've had sheriff's departments and we've had others coming out and saying we won't enforce it. Um, you know, it, we're not in a good place. Uh, and I think that while I have no doubt that uh, if we get to a situation where uh, we have no choices and 
uh, and and it really becomes uh, absolutely critical. I, the governor will do what he needs to do. I have no doubt about that. But I've also said that uh, you know the the legislature back in 1970 set up our public health system and said, this is how we want to run public health. And we want to have seven public health districts and we're charging them. The legislature didn't give that power to the governor that gave it to the public health districts. And I think, yes, uh, we can have a, a debate about what the governor should or shouldn't do. But we also need to understand a lot of what we're asking the governor to do is because local leaders and authorities have failed us. And I really think we should not let them off the hook, uh, whether the governor acts or not. Um, I think we have to hold our mayors, our city councils, our county commissioners, our public health districts to account. Because I suspect if, uh, if all of us expect the governor to make all those decisions, I think he'd be happy to do it. But let's get rid of all the bureaucracy below it that's not fulfilling their responsibilities. How much uh, of that do you think comes down to political will? Um, not necessarily the governor, but the local health districts. Oh, I think a lot of it. Uh, uh, and this has been extremely disappointing to me. I have been planning for pandemics in healthcare for 15, 20 years. There are so many things that we just assumed would happen that haven't happened. We thought there would be a national stock, uh, a strategic stockpile there to support us. That has uh, to a large extent not been the case. We thought that in a public health crisis, people would rally and say, tell us what to do and we'll do it. And that has not been the case at all. And I, I really think that, you know, I've been a student of leadership. I have uh, tried to learn all the things that I could to make me a better leader. And I really do think leadership matters. And I think it's leadership at the top. And I think the fact that this president has been the most anti-science, anti-public health leader that I can certainly think of in history. Maybe historians can give me another example, but I can't think of one. And I think that has greatly greatly undermined our our efforts and turned what should be a rallying of our country to overcome a crisis to one of sowing political discord and division. And uh, the ironic consequence is the people who complain to me the most about stay-at-home orders, lockdowns, having to wear masks, uh, all these things that we've done are, and haven't done those things are the very people complaining now, we don't have our sports, we don't have our kids in school, all this stuff. Well, you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. You have to go along with these criteria if we want to have, if ironically, where people are making this a freedom argument that I'm not going to wear a mask because I'm free. Uh, well, guess what? You're not wearing a mask and you're not agreeing to do these uh, things has actually restricted everybody's freedoms because we have had to close businesses. We have not had kids in school. We haven't been able to have full sports, all these things. Uh, and, and it's just, it's just a mess. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, we're, we're getting a couple more questions having to do with schools um, from Facebook. Uh, a couple of folks have asked about um, children uh, being asymptomatic spreaders very often and the fact that we're not regularly testing. Um, and I've also wondered about this. Is it safe for schools to be open if we can't monitor asymptomatic spread? I mean, I've seen stories um, nationally about uh, schools aren't spreading and we haven't seen infections among students, but we're not regularly testing students. So how do we know that? Um, mm -hmm. What do you think? Is it safe for schools to be open if we can't monitor that kind of thing? You know, it's a really great question. And I, and I don't think we know the answer. There is, um, to my knowledge, uh, as we tried to look at other countries that opened their schools 
prior to the opening of our new school year. What we found is kind of variable results. Some schools did very well. Some schools had outbreaks, but all of those schools opened in levels of dramatically less disease transmission than what we've had in our communities. So to my knowledge, the United States is very unique in opening schools with this much disease transmission in our communities. You have to know that if there is very high disease transmission, which is the case in many of our areas of Idaho, what that means is the statistical likelihood of students and many students and staff and teachers showing up to school infected goes up. Uh, so this is definitely a risk. Um, it's, it's very interesting to look at the data and what we're seeing. We're seeing conflicting information. I have an idea how to reconcile a lot of this, but we're seeing a lot of conflicting evidence as to whether schools contribute to community spread or not. And I think that is an overly simplistic question. I think the answer is yes, but not all schools equally. So for example, to date, based on the studies that we have uh, across the world, it does not appear that elementary schools are a big contributor to spread. It does appear that somewhere around age 12 and above, 13 and above, now you do get into the territory where those kids do contribute to, to spread. So our middle schools, our high schools, I do think those are going to be problematic. And, you know, I think this is part of the reason why a lot of the schools, when they opened in phases, they started the young ones first. Um, that does appear to be safer. Um, colleges and universities, on the other hand, appear to be the most dangerous and the most contributing to community spread. And if you look at the counties where we have our colleges and universities, those are very high transmission areas. The other thing is, if you just look at what's been happening in Idaho with our case counts, and I've talked about, I predicted we'd have a third spike. We're, we're in it now. We're on the uprise. Um, if you look at that, it's temporally associated with the opening of schools. Now, that doesn't mean cause and effect, but there's some kind of association because they're, they're temporally related. Uh, and then if you look at the number of infections that are happening in five to 10, you know, uh, 10 to 13, 13 to 17 year olds, they're all increasing. So I do think schools are contributing in some way. Uh, I think the older grades more so, colleges and universities the worst. Uh, I think there's also an argument that to your very point about these asymptomatic children, uh, Actually, it's possible that schools are helping to stop some of that spread, too, because it may be that if those kids were at home, we really wouldn't know about it. But when we do see uh, asymptomatic people with infections, they transmit to people who are do become symptomatic. We identify those. Then the contact tracing tells us about the others and they get identified. And so it in a in a kind of that way, we may be it may be a mixed blessing. You know, it may be part of the uh, part of the explanation of why it's getting worse. It also may be part of the containment. It's just really hard. And and I tell you what, I, I think any judgments that we're making about school right now are premature. Uh, a lot of schools are just now getting going. I think we need to look at this around the end of November, beginning of December. And I think we could see a very different picture as we have cold and flu season, uh, less ability to have classes outside, more students in person, less ability to distance. Um, all of those things may make a difference. <clears throat> Yeah, and we know that Idaho has one of the uh, lower rates of uh, vaccination, flu vaccination for children yep. too. So yes. I hope yes. that people 
do you get their children and themselves vaccinated this flu season? Um, it's been great to see all of the drive up flu clinics for folks who maybe yeah. don't want to um, go in. Uh, it's also pretty fast to do that. Uh, yeah. We got a good question from um, Bill on Facebook. What do you think of Central District Health changing their measurement system to determine the phase we are in for schools? Well, uh, it's interesting. I've had some conversations with people uh, recently. And uh, my conversation goes along the lines, I understand if, I mean, we're dealing with a, uh, a, a once in our lifetime uh, pandemic, uh, we're dealing with um, uh, uh, something we had no knowledge of uh, back in January to something that we have a lot more knowledge about now. And, and with that, and with observing others' experience, uh, it certainly might cause us to change our criteria or change the way we look at things. That's understandable. What I really think has been the major problem in managing what's going on with the schools is communication and transparency. Um, I think people will understand that as we learn more, we might change our views. Or if our experience is different than others' experience, that could cause us to change things. I think people will understand that. I think what really irritates people and what builds distrust is when we don't tell them, here's what we're seeing. Uh, here's where we're seeing cases. Here's where we're not. Um, and when we're not transparent, and then when we don't communicate the decisions. So, uh, uh, you know, for example, school boards, uh, you know, if you, I know you listen to some of these school board meetings, uh, I do, uh, it's just painful. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's unfocused and, and it's because they don't have a good decision-making framework. Uh, with the criteria, weighted criteria, uh, expert input, and, and evaluation against those criteria. And because of that, uh, while these people, bless their hearts, uh, most of them are volunteers, uh, they're, they're trying to do their best, this is a new situation for them, but this, this lack of structure and it, it just causes, it seems like we're just bouncing all over the place. And one day it's this. And, and, and as I told uh, uh, one trustee recently, um, your decisions aren't even internally consistent. Uh, for example, uh, one school board made a decision one week that, okay, we're in red, we're going to continue remote learning. It's not safe to have students on, on campus. But the next week said, uh, we're going to, you know, we're all in for sports. Well, um, how do you explain that? If it's not safe to be in class, how is it safe to be in sports? And, and what I've told the, the boards, you may have a really good reason and explanation, and you may have one that hadn't occurred to me, and that's great, but why don't you explain it to us? And 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 I I've said we don't have to agree with your decision, but if we can understand how did you arrive at your question, what factors did you consider, how did you weigh them, what did how did you come to at least we know there's a logical way that they've come to conclusions, uh, and we can accept that we might disagree with it, but at least it seems like there's a rhyme or reason. Whereas without the communication, without the transparency, so much of this seems like, uh, I, you know, people can't follow it, can't understand how they're making decisions and parents are getting caught off guard. And I hear from a lot of parents, you know, I can't change my work schedule over a weekend. You know, when you, when you come out with new guidance and completely change things, uh, I need a little time to prepare and make my plans. So I, I think I just encourage, you know, both the public health and the schools, let's be more transparent. Uh, let's communicate better. Let's explain ourselves. And I think things will go a lot better. <clears throat> Uh, and Bill's question actually referenced something else that relates directly to that transparency and um, ease of understanding of what we're talking about. So 
one of the things that we get this question all the time, uh, Chad Craig recently wrote a story mm -hmm. explaining just the positivity rate piece of it, because we get different information from different websites, different yeah. sources. Um, the state's numbers don't match Johns Hopkins. Can you shed any light on that? Why, why is it that they don't match? So uh, it, it depends on which specific measure and which website we're talking about. But let me take the um, the test positivity issue. And and let me just give a shout out to, to Chad uh, for his excellent reporting uh, and to all the reporters like you, Audrey, and others that have really been helping get the answers to these questions and get this out to, to readers so we can understand. So, when you look at data, uh, what's very important is to understand their definitions. Uh, so for, let me just take an example. Uh, a, a number of months ago, uh, if you looked across the country, Idaho was down really near the bottom in terms of the reports of our testing uh, activity. And but when you look at the definitions, what was happening in the national counts is they were including the PCR test, the stick the you know the swab up your nose test, and antibody tests. Now, antibody tests are all the rage, and everybody wants one. Uh, but most of the time, it's of little use uh, to us, and it's certainly not helpful in managing a epidemic or a pandemic that's happening right now. But because the other states were reporting PCR and antibody tests, and Idaho was only reporting PCR tests, it made us look like we weren't doing well in testing. When you correct the data and say, let's just just look at PCR tests, Idaho went from down at the bottom to up to the middle or a little bit above. And, and so you have to understand what is being reported. What am I looking at? Another thing is you have to, besides the definitions, you have to know the sources of the information. Uh, where are they getting it? Um, a lot of these websites that you go to get their data from our state. As a general rule, the original source of data will always be your best source because somebody that's taking data from somebody else may manipulate it or use it in a different way than uh, uh, the state did. So uh, the state is always my go-to. I always look at the state data until it's showing me something that doesn't make sense. Um, in this specific example about test positivity, what our state decided is if there's a lab that is only reporting positive tests, uh, in other words, it's not telling us about all the tests they're doing and which ones were negative, only the positives, we'll count, we'll put those in our case counts. So we won't, that will be a positive count, but we're not going to include it in the testing positivity. And that makes perfect sense because the testing positivity is the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests. If you don't have a lab telling you the total number of cat tests, if you're only adding to the numerator and not putting anything in the denominator, you're going to get a real high number. And that's what the Johns Hopkins site did. They included those. We don't include those. And I think it, to great credit, I, let me just say, our state, our uh, uh, health department workers and our public health workers are exceptional. Uh, they really are. I'm so impressed with them. And we have a state epidemiologist who manages all this data. And when they do the data on the Idaho site, they're going through every specific case and checking, is this right? And they're adjusting our data as we uh, determine, no, this wasn't correct. And then they correct the data. I don't think a lot of those other websites are doing that. So as a general rule, always trust the state numbers more. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, so positivity rates, we've got right now, St. Luke's is reporting for Magic Valley. It's looking like the two week positivity rate is near 20%. Mm. World Health Organization says it needs to be lower than 5% yes. to be opening anything. Um, so it's right. significantly higher than it needs to be. 
very alarming. Um, and where they also had, uh, I believe, 40 COVID positive patients. It's one in four of their their patients over the, the weekend, I believe it was. Um, yeah. That's a lot. So, but there's no mask mandate there. Um, and I don't know, you know, if, if the, the health board would do that, but um, what can we tell people who are wondering, why are we still stuck in stage four? We got into stage four and it's just getting a lot worse. We're obviously not going to exit it anytime soon. Um, when do we pull back to stage three? Is that even yeah. something that's being discussed by the working group? Uh, that's not our focus uh, right now. We're uh, actually focused on uh, quite a few other uh, issues, um, and that and and it could come to be the case that that's what we would need to do. But you know, the big problem, um, and I just want to figure out how to say this in a nice way. We have to stop looking to the government to tell us to do the right thing. Um, we, we, we need to appreciate we're in a bad spot. Um, we said ever since March, April, May, we said what we understand about coronavirus is going to come back and it's going to come back with vengeance in the fall. Uh, we're correct about that. The only thing that we were incorrect is we thought it would go a lot lower during the summer, uh, and it didn't. In fact, we had our second spike July and August. We are in for a rough ride right now. And the reason is, if you look at our first spike back in March, uh, April, it was less than half what we saw in July, August. And then... But what the difference was, after March, August, we actually came down really low. I mean, the, the stay at home order worked uh, and and it makes sense because this virus is spread by people coming into contact. If you stay at home, you're not going to likely come into contact. The So it came down. Then we had our second spike. The problem we're facing right now, we never came down where we need to from the second spike. If you look at it, it comes up and before it got down, we started our third spike. So we already started at a high uh, level and I think this spike will be much higher than our second spike. And we haven't even factored in influenza and all the other respiratory viruses that we're just starting to see. In addition, the weather is gonna be changing. We're gonna be moving inside. I'm really worried about November and December when people want to travel and come visit family. I'm worried about that. And in addition uh, to, to all of this, what really scares me is hospitalizations lag cases. So whenever you see an uptick in cases, it's going to be two, three weeks before you see the hospitalizations go up. Right now, the group, the age group that's getting infected the most is in this like 20 to 30 age group. When that's the case and you put young people in this as intermediaries in this chain of spread, it takes longer till you reach the older, uh, the vulnerable. And so it could even be a little bit longer. But what's happening is we were still having a lot of hospitalizations from this second spike. And now we've started the third spike and we're entering into influenza season. So one of the things I'm really worried about is our hospitals. And, uh, you know, for those who haven't spent much time worrying about your hospitals, um, you should, because here's the consequences of too much activity in our hospitals. Number one, Healthcare workers get infected just like everybody else does. And we could have shortages of healthcare workers. And we're seeing that to some degree. And it's fine to have a hospital bed, but if you don't have the staff to take care of the person in that bed, that bed does you no good. If the hospital doesn't have staffed beds and you get really sick, that means we have to transfer you. And in Idaho, a lot of times that means a helicopter ride. So that's not only expensive, 
but we're adding more risk to your care because it's now going to be hours and we're going to have to take the risk of transporting you in the air, uh, those kind of things. And don't forget that it's not just COVID. Uh, people are still having heart attacks. People are still having strokes. People are having time sensitive emergencies where they need to get to their hospital and they need to get there quickly and they need an intervention. And we're putting a lot of stress on the healthcare system right now. And that's this is before we actually even have our influenza. So I'm, I'm a little concerned. Is that something that the working group is working on? You, you said that you're yes. working on other things besides looking at stages. Um, what what yes. is the working group working on and trying to make well, sure hospitals are ready? This was uh, one of the topics. And, uh, you know, what we're talking about is way to get the words out where the uh, state has really got a good communication plan. We're trying all different kinds of media, traditional, non-traditional to get the word out. Uh, you said it earlier, Audrey, the, the single best thing that you can do to help your local hospital is if you would get you and your family out and get a flu shot. Do it as soon as you can. My wife and I are going Thursday. Go get your flu shot. Uh, the, the other thing is we have got to get the level of spread down. And where we're seeing the spread the most is in these smaller gatherings that people have kind of a false sense of security. In other words, I'm just going to get together with some of my extended family that we don't live with, or I'm going to get together with some of my, my friends. And of course, you know, my family and my friends wouldn't be infected. Of course, we often find they're wrong. Um, and it's these get togethers, barbecues, uh, uh, backyard parties, uh, those kind of things that's uh, and in the home, uh, spreading where somebody in the family gets infected and now infects the rest of the family. That's where we're seeing the most of our cases right now. We've got to stop this. We've got to slow it down. And the other thing is uh, we're having people act carelessly. Uh, we are seeing weddings of 100, 150 people that just make me cringe uh, we've got to be careful right now. And that means avoiding large gatherings. That means keeping our distance. When you do have to be out, keep your distance. And if you can't assure yourself that you're always going to keep that distance, wear a mask. We've got to get this disease activity down. So we're spending a lot of time talking about that in the work group. We're making a lot of pre uh, preparations right now for the vaccine. Uh, we're talking about testing. We're talking about schools. Um, so these are all topics of, uh, of uh, concern to the working group. <laughs> well, I hope um, maybe you'll be able to join us another time to talk about the vaccine when it, it starts mm -hmm. to be rolled out. Um, yeah. I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about if there is any possible safe way to gather with family during the holidays, um, particularly with a lot of folks having been pretty isolated for the past seven months. Um, is there a safe way to gather over the holidays? So uh, let me start off with uh, people always ask me that. Is this safe? Um, the question is, what do you mean by safe? Do you mean, is this safe that there's no way I can get coronavirus this way? Or do you mean this is safer than if I go out to a bar or something? So uh, I, I, I need to understand what people mean because there is going to be risk anytime you get together with people that you don't live with. Now, with that said, let me tell you, I am completely empathetic. My mother is in her 80s in Houston. I had planned a trip to go see her in April. I had to cancel because of uh, COVID because I'd be putting myself and her at risk, and I didn't want to do that. But you know, I haven't seen my mom in, in over a year, and, um, and so I'm sympathetic. My wife is pleading with me. Uh, she's got some uh, family that spent Christmas last year alone, doesn't want to do it again. And she's begging me, gee, David, figure out a way they can come and visit. Well, it's really tough. So here's what I would say. Um, the, the things you need to consider is what kinds of risks do the people that you plan to get together put themselves uh, in? 
In other words, uh, if you look at uh, my wife and I, we take very few risks. Uh, we stay at home. We've been doing the right things. We're likely relatively safe. On the other hand, if the gathering is going to involve a 21 year old who's been going to college, been getting together at bars or parties, uh, that's going to be a really high risk. Uh, so we have to understand who's going to be involved and what kind of risks have they already subjected themselves to. The second thing uh, we have to consider are what are the risks of anybody that's going to be involved uh, to having people over. So, for example, I talked to a parent the other day uh, who's got an organ transplant and is taking immunosuppressive medicine. And it's like you just can't afford to take any of the chances that other people might decide to take. Uh, so we have to understand what are the risks? What are the ages of the people? What are the health conditions of the people? How bad would be the risk if somebody did get infected? And then we have to understand where are they coming from and how are they coming? So, uh, you know, are they coming from an area where there's a lot of disease spread? The higher the disease spread, the more likely they may be uh, exposed or have the virus. And then how are they going to get here? So, for example, one of my followers asked me, what if uh, it, we want to get together with just one other couple? What if we both both couples quarantine for two weeks before getting together? Well, that's a pretty good idea. The questions are, is it going to be a strict quarantine? What do they mean by quarantine? Uh, are they still going out to the store or are they having things delivered? But if they're really quarantining and they do it for two weeks, that's really good. But then the question is, how are they getting to your house? Are they flying? Are they driving? Are they coming on a bus, a train? Uh, how are they coming? Because the exposures are going to be very different. And if somebody has to fly, uh, that's going to negate all the benefits you just got from the quarantine. So uh, really for these, I'm not saying there aren't ways to get together for the holidays, but we have to consider the specifics of each circumstance. And then we have to give you guidance about here's how to mitigate the risk at every step or say the risks are way too high for, for this. You just shouldn't do it this year. We'll get together next year. But being realistic, we're being careful means different things to different people. Some That's people right. may have more awareness of, mm -hmm. of transmission. Some people may feel like they're being safe and they, they're being exceptionally safe or they're, yeah. or they're not. Um, is there any kind of, you know, scientifically based measurement, online form, a questionnaire People don't want to grill their loved ones. You know, I don't yeah. want to ask my mom, hey, have you been going to, you know, going out to eat all the time and going to bars? Yeah. Um, you so you there, know, I don't I, I don't know of one, but Audrey, maybe you and I should create one. Uh, the uh, you're quite right. And that's why I said, even when that person told me about their idea of having the two couples quarantine, we got to be clear. What does that mean? Do, do they think they're quarantining if they stay at home other than go to school? Uh, or do they think that's or they're staying home other than going to the to the store and, and things? You know, there's as you say, there's different degrees of being safe. And you really have to understand what is the conduct of those people uh, as to know how much risk have they been subjected to? Right. I'd like to answer, get uh, an answer to one question that's, um, it is related to, to coronavirus, but it's a little off of what we've been talking about. Um, Mylene Langley in Boise asked, if the ACA gets voted out in the Supreme Court, um, what does Dr. Pate think will be the most significant impact with the loss of the ACA? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I'm very fearful of this. I, I have uh, written extensively about this. Uh, in my legal judgment, uh, the individual mandate is now unconstitutional. However, I believe that it should not, that it should just be severed from the law and that the ACA should be able to stand without it. That's going to be the critical question before the Supreme Court. And that is uh, because oftentimes, provisions of a law will be found unconstitutional. 
oftentimes Congress inserts language that says, if there's a part of this law that's unconstitutional, it can be severed, the rest of the law stands. Uh, Congress did not do that with the ACA. And so now it's up to the courts. Uh, the legal precedent is courts should find every way they can to allow the rest of the law to stand. I think they should in this case, but you know, the makeup of the court is a lot different than the last time the ACA was challenged. So I am fearful about this and I don't think enough attention has been given to what the implications are as your listener is um, asking. I think the number one most important consequence of the ACA being struck down is what's called guaranteed issue. Guaranteed issue is a provision in the Affordable Care Act that says you cannot be denied health insurance because of whatever your medical history is. Uh, if, if people can think back before 2010, um, they know that a lot of people had pre-existing conditions that the uh, insurance companies either would say, we're not going to insure you, or we'll insure you, but we're going to really hike your premiums up. So guaranteed issue means people could not be denied to have insurance. I think that's the number one provision. The number two provision is called community rating, which means if you think again, back before 2010, what used to happen is the insurance company would get my health history. They'd look at my gender, they look at my age, they would look at my medical history, they would look at whether I smoked, and then they would determine, okay, where am I? How costly am I like to be? And then they would set my premium accordingly. The ACA required community rating, which means that the only factors in setting that premium that the insurance can take into consideration is your age, uh, what uh, what particular area you live in of the country and whether you smoke. So they could not hike your premiums up because you had diabetes or you had high blood pressure or whatever. So those are the two most important. There's many more implications of the ACA being struck down and they'll be very bad uh, for Idahoans uh, uh, and, and for people at large. What I think the huge concern about it is right now is the the case is going to be heard next month. The case will be decided in the first six months of next year. When that happens, we are likely still in this pandemic. That means a lot of people losing health insurance coverage or no longer being able to afford it. And it means that, uh, especially with a lot of people who have lost their jobs and with it lost their health insurance, now they're not going to be able to afford health care. And we know what happens when people can't afford health care. A lot of people avoid getting it with bad outcomes. A lot of people do end up getting it. And our hospitals, which are already on financial brinks because of COVID, now will have to absorb a lot more bad debt and charity care, which could push some of our hospitals over into closing. And the other thing is that without these safeguards of the Affordable Care Act, given that we are starting to see so many long-term effects from COVID, the long haulers, myocarditis, other kinds of complications, it is possible that insurance companies will say, oh, if you had COVID, you now have a pre-existing condition. And in fact, we're either not going to insure you or we're going to raise your uh, premiums up significantly. So those are my major concerns. I'm glad you brought up the pre-existing conditions. Daryl and Boise had that exact question. If someone recovers from COVID-19, does insurance consider that you now have a pre-existing condition? Um, yeah, and today they can't. Today they can. Yeah, today they can't. But next year, depending on what the Supreme Court that says, it could be a whole different issue. And that's yeah. concerning. And they would potentially be able to deny coverage on that basis? If the ACA is struck down. That's right. And... Uh, you know, unless Congress comes together with a new uh, plan. Now, you know, uh, one of the things that I've been disappointed about is, uh, you know, President Trump's been running on striking down the ACA uh, since the election back in 2016. 
And, you know, that's fine. I, I personally have had much to fault about the ACA. And when it was being enacted, I came out with a lot of criticisms against it. But it is what we have. And so if you're going to strike it down, we at least need to know, OK, what are we going to do instead? And we haven't seen that plan. And the president keeps alluding to this plan, uh, but I don't know anybody that's seen it. And my guess is that that plan may be of about as much substance as our COVID uh, national strategy plan, which uh, scares me. So, um, you know, maybe Congress can come to the rescue and we don't know what's going to happen with the election uh, and what, what's going to happen with control of the White House, what's going to control of the Senate. Um, it could be that Congress could intervene here, but we just don't know. Right. I think we have time for one more reader question. Um, Kristen in Boise asked, what should we know about eating at restaurants as the weather gets colder? It's been nice to sit on a patio far away from others, but the CDC put out that you are putting yourself in very high risk situation dining in. Can you please explain why that is and alternative options? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, so just so you know, since uh, COVID, I've not been to a single uh, dine-in restaurant. I I don't go in there. I've long suspected that we have airborne transmission of that virus. I think we now have general agreement there is airborne transmission of this virus, and I'll explain what that is. But I do think uh, sitting outside, physically distanced, in the air with everybody wearing masks, I think that's very safe. Personally, I have most of uh, the restaurant food delivered, um, but the concern about dining in is this issue of airborne transmission. Now, what you've heard about is wear masks and be six feet apart. That's because of droplet transmission. That is when I'm speaking, little, little bubbles of secretions and virus, if I was infected, are coming out of my, math, my mouth. If I wear a mask, it will block a lot of those so that they don't go to you. And generally those uh, travel for the most part about three feet to some point about six feet. And that's why we say stay six feet away. That's droplets. But there's another mode of transmission called airborne. Airborne is, I, I mean, I guess maybe the best example I give you, imagine if you sprayed um, deodorant or hairspray, those really, really tiny little things. Uh, aerosols. Um, that's what we're talking, not droplets, which are bigger and will get caught by your mask, but these aerosols. And what they do is they travel in airstreams. So wherever the air uh, uh, return is in the, in the building, the uh, airstream is moving towards that air return. That's why in schools, I tell the teachers, make sure that your desk is not right under the air return because everything's being directed your way, if that's the, the case. And in restaurants, we've seen a study, a very good study, where people three tables away, that the tables were already spaced, people infected at that first table infected people at the third table because they were right under that air return. And these particles can stay st suspended in the airstreams. So that's the danger with eating in a restaurant, uh, added to the fact that when you eat, you have to take your masks off. We actually had a recent study that was very exciting that uh, because we thought masks mostly just work for the droplets, but it showed that it would actually decrease aerosols 65%. So the chance of people, if you're indoors, uh, your big risk is this airborne transmission, but masks decrease that significantly. But in restaurants, you have to take masks off to eat or drink. And this is why bars, restaurants, those kinds of things are, are, are still of a significant concern. All right, I'm gonna try and squeeze in one more question because okay. we just got a really, um, we've got a couple of people asking about this on Facebook. I think it's great. Um, uh, Meg is wondering about reinfection um, and I think a couple other people are too. What do we know about reinfection rates? Um, I know very little is known with confirmed cases, but what can you tell us? So um, it doesn't appear to be real common, but we don't know yet. Uh, but we do have really convincing evidence that reinfections are occurring um, and they can occur. 
we don't know um, who can get reinfected or can everybody get reinfected and what the correlation of this is to your um, whatever immunity you might have. But clearly, people uh, we've demonstrated people can be reinfected as soon as six weeks, um, probably longer for most people. But um, uh, I think the important thing here, two things. Uh, one is, if you previously believe you had COVID or know you had COVID, and let's say you got it in our first spike, you have to take precautions now. You should not assume that you're immune and you should assume that you can be reinfected. So that's the first thing. The second thing is in most infections, the second or third time you get reinfected, it's usually milder. And that certainly seems to be most of the cases of reinfection with this virus. However, we now have a couple where the people actually got far sicker the second time they were infected, which is unusual. So reinfection is a risk. Keep taking precautions uh, and, and do that until we can get the vaccine and we can give you the advice when it's safe to stop taking those precautions. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for covering so much ground. We really appreciate it. Uh, My pleasure. Thanks, for sharing what you know. uh, thanks to our viewers for joining us and for asking such wonderful questions. Um, you can find more COVID-19 coverage at idahostatesman.com slash coronavirus. Uh, my name is Audrey Dutton. I'm a healthcare reporter for the Idaho Statesman. Um, you can support our work covering the pandemic and support community conversations like these by subscribing to the Idaho Statesman. And you can do that by going to idahostatesman.com slash subscribe. Have a great afternoon and thank you so much.